So welcome to part two of Humanizing Work for a Better World with Steve Hunt and Robert Richardson. My pleasure to be with you again today and we're going to be talking about uh, a number of areas around work-life wellness and living better. And these are questions I ask all my podcast guests, so I'm really excited to ask them to you. So my first question is, how has the pandemic been an opportunity to evolve our work and lives? It, yeah, Laura, it has been such a fantastic opportunity and I'm a glass half full person. One of the things, as weird as it sounds, is we were lucky enough to have this pandemic last as long as it did in a strange way, because if it hadn't lasted as long as it did, we would have just snapped back to the way we were doing stuff. And mm -hmm. when this first hit, I remember talking to an HR leader who said, I hope this changes the mindset of our leaders. And it is, it's created this thing to really challenge a lot of assumptions about work. Remote work being obviously probably the biggest one that we don't all need to sit in the same office to be effective. But there's other ones too about the intersection of work and life. The fact that people are embracing the fact that we have families and we, you know, we used to like go, oh, pretend like you don't have a family at work, you know, and this false separation of these things. Mm -hmm. So I think really the, the big opportunity is it's, it's really made companies at every level of the organization simultaneously challenge assumptions about how work should work, which has been fantastic. That's awesome. Well put, Steve. So what about you, Robert? Yeah, I'd say, you know, about the same. It really forced it, companies to experiment too, you know, and, and I think, um, I think often companies found that their initial impression was wrong. Right. You know, when when it comes to office workers, for instance, actually, a lot of times we found that people were more productive from home. And darn it, I, I don't miss my commute. <laughs> right. And it, my commute wasn't even that long. Uh, but but it just saps me of a little bit of life every single day. You know, and, and now that's how I feel personally. Right. Um, but I think what we're finding is is that you know, this experimentation has brought companies to a place where they can offer flexibility, where we feel uh, less compelled to make people work from an office just because we assumed that that was the best way to do it forever. And now maybe some people work from an office, some people work part-time in an office, some people work from home. And so I think it's been a just a fantastic experiment. Uh, a lot of tragedy, right? I mean, let's acknowledge mm -hmm. that there was, you know, a huge uh, death toll to pay for this, uh, you know, and everything else. But, um, but you know, to Steve's point, when you start to, you know, really work and and look at the bright side and you know the positive things that have come out of this, I think a lot of experimentation or experimentation results uh, have proven better ways to work and better yeah. ways to collaborate. And I guess you can build on that too. And listening. One of the things across our company is that it's so funny. I remember talking to a company, our executives have spent a lot of time listening to their employees and concerns. And you're kind of going, shouldn't they have always been doing that? <laughs> but they weren't, you know? And so now hopefully that continues. And it's got companies yeah. to really understand people want to do the right thing. People come to work wanting to be positive and wanting to be an impact. And they just want to be listened and supported. And when you listen and support people, you know, it, it, companies work better. And I guess historically, we weren't doing that not at all. So yeah. that's been a positive. Yeah, I, I would totally agree. And I mean, look at where you are, Robert. You look like you're in a nice cabin. Is that correct? Yeah, you are. You are. So so here, at, you know, speaking of work-life balance, uh, you know, we have some good friends who just very last minute, uh, you know, and, and speaking of work-life balance, their work provided this for them, believe it or not. So this is a perk that uh, my my friends receive from uh, their, uh, you know, from their corporation. And uh, so, you know, we came out here and joined them at a cabin and, you know, my kids and their kids have been playing all week and I'm, I'm working all day. And then we go out in the back and we have a fire by the, by the lake and, and hang nice. out. And it's been, yeah, it's been wonderful. So, you know, this ability to work from anywhere is, is just incredible. And you probably can't yeah. see the view really, but, uh, but I promise <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Yeah, it looks beautiful outside. So that is awesome. So speaking of, you know, living a good life and work life wellness, which is a term that we're using to replace balance per se, it's more about being well in your work and well in your life. What does that look like f for both of you personally? And we like to hear from our guests because 
even though you may be a thought leader in the world on these topics, you know, what's really happening for you? And uh, we just want to hear about that and learn from, from how you're dealing with your own wellness. So who wants to go first? Robert, how about... I'll jump in. You know, the ability to play Mario Brothers with my four-year-old. <laughs> you know, uh, it's uh, it's having that time. You know, for for my kids. You know, and I, I I tease a little bit about Mario, but my child is obsessed with Mario Brothers. And uh, and a good day for him and my eight-year-old is uh, if Dad can get off of work in time to come downstairs and play a quick game before dinner. You know, and and so it's nice. sort of emblematic for me of, uh, you know, what a, a good uh, balance should be, right? It's the ability to really give work your all and feel like you have uh, purpose and meaning at work, mm -hmm. but then also to be able to turn right around. Uh, and if you're like me and you work from home, uh, walk across the hallway to, you know, uh, hang out with your children and, and really be supportive of them in their lives as well. Yeah. I would, That's awesome. I would agree Steve? with what Robert said. I mean, for me, it's been that in, that integration and being able to tie those together like, my kids are older, but for years I coached sports for them. And I was able to do that because I travel a lot, but I work remotely. So, you know, I'm five minutes from the field. I could take a conference nice. call right up there and run over there. And also being able to blend these. Um, I remember going on a business trip to Rome and meeting up with one of my nephews who happened to be over there, then going to Korea and seeing my sister who happened to be there. You know, we were laughing about it, but being able to find ways to have a job that lets you blend the two together, I think is, um, is a really, but for men, for me has been a really blessing. I realize not all jobs allow that, but for me, I, I've been able to do that, which is really nice. That's awesome. Yeah. I miss that international travel for that reason, the adventures mm -hmm. that go along with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that's awesome. So my third question is what has been your greatest challenge when it comes to your work-life wellness and how have you worked at overcoming it? So this could have been a challenge pre pandemic when, you know, you were having to, um, work in the office more, or it could be a challenge that you're facing now. For um, me, it is switching off. I am really lucky. I love what I do. I get tremendous satisfaction from it. I, I joke about it. He's like, who wants to, hey, Steve, are you willing to talk about talent management for 30 minutes? Like, <laughs> would I? I'd love to. I, mean, I, I just find this stuff really interesting, you know, and um, so probably if I don't guard against it, I just think about it too much. And it's, okay. you know, trying to really stop thinking about it for me is, is I have to consciously think of do that. So you went off the grid for a week. I know this because yeah, I knew you were going away. There's no talking about podcast for seven days, right? Mm -hmm. So how is that to be off the grid? And what was it like to be in the Grand Canyon? Oh, my gosh, it was amazing. And I think it really was, um, you know, almost the term spiritual just because of that. I'm going back mm -hmm. to this where I was in this place that is so visually interesting. It's hard to imagine that even in the conversations I had with my family, normally I'm talking to my nephews and stuff, we talk about work, we said, we don't want to talk about anything that will take us mentally out of the canyon. And um, it was really, really good for me. I don't quite know how yet, <laughs> but, uh, but I have to do things like that. I mean, for me, I, I, it's, I sometimes joke that, you know, with my kids, they were a blessing because they, for me, when I, I remember my kids were little, when I picked up my little infant son, boom, it just knocked all work right out of your head, which for <laughs> me was very, very healthy. I have, to, I have to create things to make me think about something other than work because, as my wife put it, I don't idle well. I'm not a person who just sit and not think about anything. So. Well, I see a guitar behind you. That could be a distraction. I do that too. Yeah, that's another <laughs> one. So I have to create things that take my attention away from work. Laura, you didn't realize that you don't need any outro music for this podcast. Oh. He's going to play us right out. All right. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. That'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm game. <laughs> um, no. Robert, what about you? What's been a challenge? I know you have you have littler kids than than Steve does. And, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I do. I have four kids, uh, ranging from yeah. twelve to uh, uh, to four, and you know. I think that, you know, they, that certainly presents its own challenge for sure, especially during a, a pandemic, you know, when uh, you have the consistent, what I call you got a minutes, you know, walking through your office and, um, mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. But I think, 
you know, if I think about my greatest challenge, it, it isn't necessarily my children because they really inspire me to work harder, you know, in a way, right? I mean, there's a lot you have to provide for. Uh, so, you know, in, in a way they're kind of inspiration, but it, it's really funny. Uh, I was just talking to my friend, Hector, uh, I'm pointing behind me, uh, you know, in the backyard where, where we were by the lake and uh, we were sitting by a, a fire, you know, and we were just talking about our families and, you know, my family has a rich tradition of fathers who literally work themselves to death. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was my uh, grandfather who I never met. It was my father who passed away in, in high school. And uh, uh -huh. and I do notice that tug in myself, right? Uh, I am absolutely the person that will work all night if need be uh, to, to finish something. Yeah. And, and so I really do struggle to, uh, like Steve, you know, turn it off and uh, and not be constantly driven 24 seven and, and to remember to darn it go play some mario brothers with with your kids mm -hmm. right and so that's yeah. that i would say is my biggest challenge and just knowing that propensity in yourself is super important right because it is a uh, propensity that can become a habit that can become an addiction, right? And yeah. workaholism is a form of addiction. Absolutely. So just knowing that and, and setting up the boundaries of the Mario Brothers, etc. Being yeah. at the cabin, it's kind of hard to work through the evening there. Yeah, but you do, you got to be cognizant of it. And, yeah. and it, I think it helps to have a little bit of family history and, and lessons to learn from, mm -hmm. uh, from the generations that came before you. Uh, yeah. So you can, you can improve. Yeah, and that was that generation, right? Work hard, you know, and then play yes. later, but work hard no matter what. And there was far less focus on health, right? Yeah, yeah, I would say yeah. so. You know, and, and if I think about my father, you know, I mean, he had a, a managerial position and, uh, you know, and, and this was kind of in the time where we thought these, uh, you know, work third shift for two months and then switch to first shift for two months. Uh, you know, and go back and forth and back and forth. There was a time when, you know, people thought that was a great way to do things because it was fair for everybody then, you know, everybody <sighs> uh, experienced the same amount of, uh, you know, crappiness, right, in their, in their uh, scheduling at times, you know, and so it was equal opportunity crappiness. And unfortunately, what's really happened is, is that led to horrific uh, sleep patterns, you know, constantly resetting your schedule, you know, obesity, uh, diabetes, oh, yeah. all the things that go along with constantly rejiggering your schedule in that way. And, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the smart way to work. No, no. So thank you for being open to sharing that with us. And I think a lot of people can learn from hearing that. So my next question is about one book or podcast you'd each recommend to help people learn about, about how to improve their work-life wellness. So I know you probably have 20 to recommend, Steve, but maybe start with one of each, a book and a podcast. <laughs> I have a book. I mean, it's interesting because it actually ties a little bit to what Robert was talking about, which one of the, um, I think a word that we need to get rid of in our vocabulary, like there's certain words of work that describe what we thought about work, like surf and proletariat, which, you know, are words people used to use to talk about workers. We don't anymore. They represent a certain <laughs> time and era. The word retirement needs to be retired that this idea of people, I'm going to work like mad and then I'm 65 and then my golden payday comes and if you don't even make it to 65, it's a, it's a terrible way to think about that somehow that there's work and then there's retirement. And the book, when really it's all about transitions, our life is all transition. I don't think we should have the word graduation either. We just transition from one thing to another. And a book that I think is really good about this mindset is a book called Stretch by Carrie Williard, a woman that I used to work with here at SAP. Mm -hmm. And it talks about how do you approach work as a constant learning activity where you're balancing, you're kind of moving. Because the challenge of work is we're most productive when we're doing stuff we already know how to do. Mm -hmm. So you've got to focus on productivity mm -hmm. and using the knowledge that you have but you also need to work in a way that you're acquiring new knowledge and capabilities and new relationships. And it's a really good book about rethinking work so that you're constantly learning and building relationships through work itself, which I think ties broadly into life itself, where you're always, it's like we said, you know, in the last podcast, it's not good to do the same thing over and over and over again. I mean, you want to constantly be challenging your mind, building connections, 
And this mm -hmm. book, Stretch, really talks with some really practical advice on how to do that. Awesome. Thank you so much. What about you, Robert? A book yeah, or that, a podcast? Yeah, that was a good one. Um, and, and I do, uh, you know, but I have too many. Uh, so, uh, you know, one that comes to mind, and, and it's not necessarily about work, but it touches on work all the time. Uh, so Hidden Brain is just an amazing podcast that I, I never seem to be able to get enough of. Um, I'm, I'm probably not going to get the name right, but uh, Shankar Vedantam is uh the host and uh you know like the last podcast i was just scrolling through and it was about the power of apologies you know and and just this ability to reconcile which is you know always inspired me as one of the most amazing human traits you, you know yeah. forgiveness uh is is just an incredibly powerful thing and uh and so you know when you listen to these podcasts you can apply so much of it to your work life as as well as your home life um a book that I really appreciate and, um, you know, made a big difference in my life is The Code of Trust by Robin Dreek. And, mm -hmm. and when you go through this and, and you walk through the uh, five principles that he, uh, uh, you know, puts forth as, as the code, right, the code of trust, you know, it's just amazing um, how this can build bridges between people. You know, when, for instance, you let go of ego, Right. And, and you start to realize that it's not about you. Right. And, and if we always are framing things in that way and we're framing things in the benefit to you and, and, and thinking about it with empathy through your eyes and walking in, in your shoes, you know, it changes everything. And, and that is absolutely true again in your personal life. But but certainly it will pay dividends in your business life to behave in this way. That is awesome. So many, yeah, great recommendations just alone there. And um, Work Matters podcast, of course. <laughs> yeah. We should probably put that on the list, huh, Steve? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and the book Common Sense Talent Management, that's a really good one. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. And I, yeah, appreciate all your articles, Steve, as well. Definitely worth um, following those articles on LinkedIn. Dr. Stephen Hunt. All right, so um, my next question is an interesting one. If you didn't have to sleep and you could use that time to do whatever else you wanted, what would it be? Let's start with you, Steve. Okay, it would be more artistic or craft things. I'm gonna bring down my mandolin on this one. I don't know if it's in tune, but. I play a lot more music probably than That's I do. That's awesome. I, you know, um, I would definitely going back to what we were talking about earlier. I, I, you know, I would probably get into more crafts and things I haven't done. And the other thing that I wish, and a lot, not sleeping wouldn't solve this, is um, I really wish I had more weeks off to do extended trips like what I just did. I, okay. I used to sail and, but sail for multiple days, you know, where you can really just get immersed in other worlds, and it's really hard to do in our hyper-connected world. I mean. And so that's what I'd like to do. But I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really fortunate, though. I mean, I, I have to say, I, I don't feel I'm, I'm reminded of something that um, one of my brothers who sadly passed away, but who said right before he died about bucket lists. And he said a really powerful thing. He said, people always ask about bucket lists. And he goes, I'm living my bucket list. He goes, the only thing I want is more time. And that really struck me. And that's how I've tried as much as I can to live, which is not about having this list of things I want to do. It's just making sure I'm always looking forward to something that's coming up constantly. And so that's how I try to live. Yeah, I think uh, listing your your top goals um, on a regular, on an annual basis and, you know, bu a bucket list of, of a year, right? And just, you'd be surprised how many you can get done just by writing them down. Yeah, and making sure every year or month or whatever the time frame is, is something memorable. It doesn't have to mm -hmm. be something huge. I mean, this Grand Canyon trip I've wanted to do since I was 19, but, you know, doing a hike or something that you remember that was the month that I did this. There should, you know, just making sure there's always something like that happening. Absolutely. That is great. Now, what about you, Robert, if you didn't have to sleep, what would happen with that time? And don't say working those eight, eight hours. <laughs> Mario I was Brothers. Say, I don't More Mario go. Brothers. <laughs> yeah, right, right. More Mario Brothers. I'm not sure I want to go after Steve's. It was really good. Um, I know. Yeah, uh, you know, 
first off, who says we are sleeping? Um, and, you know, I think, uh, I think if I didn't need the sleep, um, you know, what I would do more of is, is review more startups. I, I hate to say it, but man, I just thrive uh, on this. There is nothing better than, you know, than interviewing somebody, uh, you know, or talking to somebody or looking at an idea that somebody has that is so profound that they are going to spend the next 10 years of their life working to change the world, you know? And, and yeah. so I guess on my, prof in my professional life, uh, if I didn't have to sleep, you know, I would spend a lot more time uh, with startups and just hearing these inspiring ideas. I, I think in my personal good. life, I'd, I'd spend more time, uh, you know, I, I play the Native American flute. Uh, so, you know, oh, I neat. could do a little bit more music as well. Maybe, Steve, we can do uh, a duet sometime. Uh, I don't know how the Mar Native American flute and your guitar will work together, but uh, we could try it sometime. Um, I think and, you have to do that on a Work Matters I, episode, yeah. and you should do it about music matters, music right? Music matters. And, <laughs> like, does listening to music at work help focus? You could make topics around music matters. Oh, I have to tell you, many many a conference call I've survived by hitting mute and grabbing one of these instruments. I <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> That's awesome. So my final question as we wrap up, if you could have one wish for a better world when it comes to work and life, what would it be for each of you? Yeah, you know, Laura, when you said, shared this before the podcast, and I thought a lot about this question, and I would say it's going to it's to say society is to rethink what makes capitalism work. I believe that capitalism, you know, working, as I say, at the intersection of business, psychology and technology, we talked in the previous episode that, you know, profitable companies are the best companies to work for. <laughs> so I am a believer in capitalism when it functions well. But it can function. But when it functions well is when people have the ability to grow and move and move up and down. And you don't have fixed perma rich and perma poor and that sort of thing. And I think in our society, currently, the way our society acts, it'd be like a, in a lot of cases is like a gardener who expects plants to earn water. If you're going to grow, you got to earn your water. I'm not going to give you water. You got to earn that water. You know, as opposed to, no, there are certain things you need to provide in a garden. You provide a foundation and then the plants naturally grow and they come up. There are things in our society, healthcare. I have known personally so many people that haven't started companies or people that own companies. This is a U.S. issue far more than a Canadian yeah, one. Yeah. Who companies don't hire people because they can't afford the health care because it's a fixed cost or people stay in jobs and maybe don't pursue their passion of starting up a new company because they can't risk their kids losing health care benefits so people don't think about health care on the impact that it has on the labor market in terms of freezing up our labor market in a really negative way education is the same one that it's in our best benefit to be surrounded by well-educated people yeah. You know, it, it's not about somebody getting something. It's about, I don't want to be surrounded by people who feel a lack of opportunity due to a lack of education. And I want to be served by people that know what the heck they're doing. But people mm -hmm. don't think of it that way. And the third one of this is a safe place for children. There is countless research that shows that so many of societal ills, whether it's homelessness, drug addiction, all criminality, all start with did kids have a safe place to live between the ages of three, and it's really specific, about two to three to about 12 to 13, hmm. that where you had a safe place where you had reliable food, you felt cared for, and whether this comes from foster care or whatever, if we really focused on just making sure kids had that in society, so many other things would just disappear because that's when you develop our coping skills. But we don't think of it. Our society still thinks about these things based on like 18th century psychology of behaviorism and punishment and greed. But that's not how we are. People no. want to have a good life. They want to contribute. Mm -hmm. And we just need yeah. to provide that environment. So that one, I really thought a lot about this. And I just wish yeah. there was some way I could magically get our society to wake up to what we know as psychologists about well, people. I, th I think, I mean, I think some people are waking up. So I'm a glass half full like you, but we have a lot of work cut out for us, Steve, mm -hmm. uh, on this. 
So thank you for sharing that. What about you, Robert? One wish, and Gosh, then we have to wrap up. Oh, it's a fabulous list. Uh, so if I had one, uh, you know, for work life, I'd say, you know, a real sense of purpose and balance at work. Mm -hmm. You know, I, okay. I think it's it's terrible, you know, to think through how many people are working jobs that they just don't care about. You, you know what I mean? And, and all we're trying to do in those cases is just earn the paycheck to support the people we love or, or to make sure you survive as an individual, right? And and it's kind of like living in purgatory. You know I mean? It turns out you don't have to die to go to purgatory. You just have to find a dead end job, you know? And, and it's, uh, it's a waste of life and it, it, you know, and it leads to depression and alcoholism and anxiety and, and all kinds of terrible things, you know? And if everybody could find a company that really aligns with what they feel like their purpose is. You know, we we would just have so many less problems in society and we would have so many people with, with such more fulfilling lives. Yeah, which is why well, we started Work Matters. We like to say our motto is, um, what is it? Uh, I'm trying to remember it now. <laughs> a better workplaces create better worlds. <laughs> Well, isn't that a good way to end? <laughs> Humanizing work for a better world. So thank you very much for being so authentic, uh, open to sharing uh, with the audience about your challenges, your wishes, uh, you know, great recommendations, which we'll put in the blog article that follows uh, the episode. And we'll end with a few chords Sorry. on the- All right. The, Should I play us out as a go. tune? Thank you to our, our show producer, Steve Rokosh, who's in the other room um, doing great audio, and he will capture that music beautifully. So thank you very much, and stay well. Thank you thank for you, having Laura. me. Laura. This has been really fun. Thank you so much for joining us today on Where Work Meets Life. I'm passionate about sharing insights from experts around the world on topics at the intersection of where work meets life. If you found this podcast useful, please share with others who may benefit and engage with us on social media. For more articles, information, and tips, sign up for my monthly newsletter at my website, drlaura.live. This podcast summary contains links to the psychology practice I founded, Work Evolution, Canada Career Counseling, and Synthesis Psychology, as well as my current employer, Humans, a nationwide organizational psychology firm focusing on culture and performance. Stay well.